or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, What's Next After the Implementation Crop? Catalyzing Action at the Intersection of Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Systems. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the Blue Jeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right and indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upvote the questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar and our Q&A session will be at the end of the event. We also have a poll today, so please check out the poll feature to answer a quick question at the start of the event. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom to adjust the window. <clears throat> Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you so much. I will now pass it to USAID's Caitlin corner Dolloff. Hi, thanks so much, Michael. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today for this AgriLinks webinar, where we're taking a look back at COP27 that just fi finished in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. My name is Caitlin Kornadoff. I'm a senior policy advisor for climate and agriculture in the Center for Agricultural Led Growth um, in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Security. I'm very excited to be moderating this panel today. Um, as Michael said, we have a poll for you, so maybe that can go live if it hasn't already. We're just hoping to get a sense for who's in the room. So feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and then also fill out that poll um, to let us know what types of institutions you're joining from. So our aim today is to both dig into the implementation effort that we're um, discussing at COP, that were discussed at COP27, and also to look ahead at the agricultural and food systems issues that will likely be elevated at COP28. Um, you can next slide just show you the presenters. So we're gonna be hearing from USAID staff um, and implementing partners who are driving climate efforts in agriculture and food systems through policy, partnerships, and programming on the ground. And then we're gonna have time for questions and discussions after we hear from the speakers. So please feel free, like Michael said, to put those um, questions into the Q&A feature. Um, and we'll be looping back to those at the end after we hear from the panelists. Um, so to get us started, I'm going to go over some basics related to international climate policy um, and the U.S. and strategies and initiatives. Um, so next slide. Make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the COP that we're referring to is the Conference of the Parties, which is an annual meeting of countries that are parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC. So this year it was in Egypt and it'll be in UAE next year. And the COP is used to assess country efforts towards achieving the goals of the convention. It's a space for government, civil society, private sector, and others to join together, to really figure out how to collectively tackle the climate crisis. This year, um, COP was called an implementation COP with less focus on making new commitments and more on reporting out on what's really being done to advance towards the 2015 Paris Agreement goals of holding warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and to support countries in tackling climate impacts. We've really seen the COP has had an increased focus on agriculture and food systems compared to the past, and Ann um, Vaughn is gonna talk more about that. Um, and it's just worth noting that given this is a USAID webinar, we are focusing on the development perspectives and how we can see really good programming in this. We won't be diving into the negotiations, for example, carnivia or loss and damage, but rather next steps in the food and climate space. Next slide. Great. So to start off, um, the U.S. presence at COP, especially with President Biden's speech, which I think we'll, we'll drop in the chat later, demonstrated that tackling climate change is a whole of government priority. And for USAID's engagement in COP, similarly, um, it signaled the elevation of climate across everything that we do, especially agriculture and food systems, um, given the link between climate crisis and the food security crisis. So here on the slide is just an overview of what's covered in USAID's climate strategy. Um, and the 2030 targets, you can see the strategic objectives and some principles. So farmers, herders, and fishers in developing countries are some of the most vulnerable to climate impacts in the last 60 years. Um, climate change has reduced agricultural productivity 
growth by an average of 21%, up to 40% in some regions. Um, so we are really ramping up our efforts in support of um, adaptation and also seizing opportunities to achieve development gains through low emission pathways. Um, so I'm gonna, yeah, okay. So that's the, the general gist. In terms of the climate strategy itself, you can see here we have targets for mitigation, adaptation, landscape management, finance, supporting countries and implementing their climate commitments and working with critical populations such as women, youth and indigenous people, all of which have direct links to agriculture and pathways to achieve climate resilient food systems. And we're gonna touch on those throughout the presentations today. The strategy also has these two strategic objectives that focus on direct action and also systems transformation. And we know food systems will be one of the, the key systems that we need to transform to ensure we have enough food for a growing population and a warm. And all of these efforts are grounded in the five principles that you can see in the middle of the screen with the icons, all of which underlie USAID's efforts generally and especially at the intersection of climate and agriculture. And we'll put a link. Next slide. Um, so our refreshed global food security strategy, that's just USG wide, also recognizes the growing impact of the climate crisis has on producers and communities from farmers' ability to grow food and fisher folks' ability to catch enough fish. Now, this is highlighted in the addition of a cross-cutting intermediary result on climate. And the GFSS also recognizes that while these are less, there are less emissions from food systems in highly climate vulnerable like Mali or Nepal, there are also huge potential co-benefits for work on mitigation and creating resilient pathways to grow food. Um, and we see the GFSS call out the need for climate smart innovations to advance our efforts. Um, and given that, go to the next slide. Um, given that, USAID is also a proud partner in the Agriculture Innovation Climate, which was launched, launched last year at COP26 with the UAE, who's hosting the next COP. Anne is going to speak more um, to aim for C, but this exciting initiative is really helping to galvanize greater investment in innovation and research and development for climate smart food systems. Um, USAID has a long history, as I'm sure most of you know, in supporting agriculture R&D, and we've seen that for every about every dollar invested, there's roughly $10 return. The USAID is driving a focus on innovation for smallholder farmers and ensuring locally led development, equity and inclusion are central to how innovations are developed. And lastly, next slide, um, but certainly not least, I want to highlight that our climate and agriculture efforts are also linked with PREPARE, or the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience, which is a whole of government effort to help 500 million people in developing countries adapt to and manage the impact of climate change. Um, PREPARE was heavily featured at COP, including um, in Biden's speech on Friday the 11th, and um, that the, his speech really gave a great summary of USA, USG-wide contributions to the COP. And I will also drop in the link to the PREPARE Action Plan. So you can see the list of initiatives that um, different parts of the US government are going to advance. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker, Anne Vaughn, who's gonna um, talk about her takeaways from COP27 and her vision for the year ahead. Anne is a senior advisor for climate in USAID's Resilience and Food Security Bureau, where she integrates climate consider considerations across food, water, and nutrition programming. She also co-leads the implementation of PREPARE. And prior to joining USAID, Anne worked at Mercy Corps. She served as a field officer for USAID in um, Kandahar, Afghanistan. She was a congressional staffer working on the foreign aid appropriations and a Peace Corps volunteer in Nicaragua. So with that, over to Anne. Great, thanks so much, Caitlin, for the introduction. And I have to apologize to everyone, I've got a scratchy voice, so sorry for, for any coughing in advance. And great to see everyone from around the world um, um, introducing yourselves in the chat and networking. Please keep, keep that up, because we love these webinars to help make sure we're um, kind of bringing people together, especially on shared interests. And some of the things that we'll be talking about today, um, I was hoping that you all could take away Three things from my remarks um, before we turn over to our really esteemed and exciting panelists um, to hear more about some digging into a lot of these topics a little bit deeper. But first sort of takeaway would love you to have is that there's increasing and exciting linkages between climate and food systems 
um, and that there are specific actions that we can take to take to have real changes in this space to make sure we're adapting and mitigating our food systems to the climate crisis. Second, aid, USAID is really eagerly engaging in the food system space to make sure um, we're helping smallholder farmers adapt to become more resilient to climate change, especially uh, those farmers and producers that are most vulnerable to the climate impacts. Um, and that also are excited in looking at mitigation co-benefits that also support our other development objectives. And third, and I think most important, we want your partnership and help in this effort. So we'll highlight ways where you can engage on these different spaces. So that's overall objectives of, of my short uh, sort of remarks, um, but wanted to dive into what, what happened at COP? What, what happened in, in November over two weeks in Egypt? Um, as Caitlin noted, it was um, also called an implementation COP, but it was also billed as an adaptation COP. That was one of the real focus of many of our partner governments going into COP as there's a growing reality and impact that climate change is having on countries around the world. Um, the Egyptian presidency reflected this concern on adaptation with a, a theme day. Every day at COP has a different theme, and there was a, a day on ag, agriculture and adaptation where the Egyptian pre the COP presidency announced the Food and Agriculture for Sustainable Transformation Initiative, or FAST, and an initiative on climate action and nutrition, or ICANN, that we'll talk about a little bit later. And also then in the pavilion area of the conference, so you have your formal negotiations and then a huge section where there's pavilions where you can get a buzz of what's the interest among your partner governments, NGOs, private sector, and other climate-focused organizations. There were at least four, maybe six standalone food pavilions that hosted food security and, and agricultural events all day long throughout the two weeks of COP. And then there's some estimates that over 200 events were held on food and climate nexus. Um, which is, I think, a, a huge, I, I don't have a graph of how much that sort of exploded, but it certainly felt like and, and seems to be a much greater interest in this space. And then in terms of participation and who came to COP, you, you really couldn't throw a stick without hitting someone who was looking at carbon markets for farmers or some other innovation that would help decrease emissions from farming or other types of regenerative ag. Um, so there was a real sort of buzz in the hallways about how to work in the food system space, both on emissions and adaptation. But really important um, for all of us to, to, to recognize is that, that looming over COP was the very real human tragedy of uh, 1.8 million children at risk of severe acute malnutrition in the horn. As we've got the fifth rainy season failed um, and it, with 350,000 children at risk of dying in Somalia alone. So we have real climate impacts um, and, and humanitarian um, concerns happening. That's just in the horn, not to speak of other impacts around the world. So there's real need um, and urgency to have action in the climate and food system space and was and felt very tangible at COP. So I'd love to move to second, my second point on how USAID was engaging and been throwing in some other partnerships with the US, um, across the US government, which includes our work on PREPARE. So as Caitlin noticed, um, noted, we had hosted at least three events on PREPARE, including one on the, the, the tenth, the first sort of big interagency um, event we had on, on PREPARE was on food systems. Um, and just as a bit of background, USAID co-leads PREPARE and hosts with our interagency partners, um, 19 other inter interagency partners on how we can help advance resilience for half a billion people. Um, and this event I just referenced on food systems was a, a very good event on how we can help adapt farmers um, and, and fishers and, and smallholders to climate change. I'll, I'll drop the recording or maybe Colin can drop the recording into the chat. But the event highlighted how the U.S. government is coming together to really elevate adaptation in food systems. For example, from USAID, where we've expanded into eight more Feed the Future countries in Africa, the Millennium Challenge Corporation made an investment of $245 million in Malawi to increase agriculture resilience and market linkages. And then the DFC announced um, investments of $1.6 billion to advance um, food security, climate solutions, and other development challenges. And then we had another um, two other prepare events, one um, where the administrator power announced a global call to action for businesses to make significant new commitments to build climate resilience. Um, this included commitments from the private sector around expansion into climate information and early warning systems, introduction of new financial products and services and innovations for climate smart food systems and really exciting insurance solutions. Um, this call to action remains open and would encourage other private sector calls to, to sign up and, and check it out. We'll drop information in the chat. And then second, as, as Caitlin noted, the Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate was a real, I think, highlight of COP and um, highlighted the importance of, importance of partnering um, with, other, with other governments, with academia, um, and with the private sector and nonprofits 
um, to really make greater investments in climate smart food systems. Um, and again, as a reminder, aim for c is an initiative launched by the U.S. and UAE at last year's COP, which is encouraging investments in research and development and mobilizing the private sector to invest more in climate smart ag. So we announced and highlighted our contributions to aim for c um, Administrator Power, she um, reaffirmed our commitment uh, to aim for c and highlighted another installment of $43 million in investments in innovation and R&D for climate smart food systems. Uh, and then also uh, she launched two more uh, innovation sprints, which are commitments by the private sector and partners um, to increase their investments in climate smart food systems. One of the first um, innovation sprint was a partnership with Bayer Crop Science and the International Rice Research Institute to improve the quality of life of smallholder rice, far rice farmers and also help decrease uh, methane emissions from rice. And the second was a partnership with Olam Food Ingredients, um, OFI, and Nestle, Mars, Wrigley, and, and other um, uh, private sector uh, actors in the cocoa space um, to help smallholder, far smallholder cocoa farmers use more climate smart agricultural practices. So we're real excited about those specific um, partnerships that we were able to highlight at COP that shows that we were implementing and working on both adaptation and mitigation. To flag for the, 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 the audience, I think it's uh, everyone's always getting more and more excited about um, reducing methane. There was an exciting, um, uh, some exciting announcements made around the Global Methane Pledge, including the launch of a food and agricultural pathway, which is gonna advance climate and food security goals through new actions and increase agricultural productivity, reduces food loss and waste, and improve the viability of agriculture in the future. And there's some significant resources for smallholder farmers were announced, and we'll drop this link in the chat um, that uh, encompasses not just work USAID's doing, but other, other partners across the government and multilaterals. And I just flag one thing where under the methane effort, um, this included USAID's work to reduce methane um, in food loss and waste, which we think is really important for increasing nutrition and improving food security. Um, and we highlighted also at COP as part of both this um, effort and, and a couple other events, our new Market Systems Partnership Grant Facility, which is available to small and medium-sized uh, entrepreneurs or enterprises in Bangladesh, Kenya, Nepal, Niger, Nigeria, and Tanzania, and still open for proposals. So please check that out if you're in any of those countries and food loss and waste. And lastly, um, USA joined State Department in celebrating the Global Fertilizer Challenge, which helped raise over 100 million to address fertilizer shortages caused by Russia's um, invasion of Ukraine. USAID's work is focusing on promoting soil health and fertilizer efficiency in Africa, and is part of a broader strategy to address the global food security crisis. Um, so real quickly, afraid I'm, I'm running out of time, um, wanna move ahead to COP28. Um, we know ag and food systems will be even more elevated at COP28, but for those of you who are perhaps, in, 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 like me, in, in a bit of a conference fatigue, you can rightly ask, so what? Why do we care about these COPs? What matters? Um, and how do we they actually uh, affect change in, in, in people's lives? Uh, and I'd, I'd really argue that we could use this momentum from COP27 and all the, the highlights I just added. Um, and knowing that the importance that food and climate will have in COP28, we've already heard very strong signals from the UAE COP presidency about the importance of food systems, which is in food security, which is very welcome. Um, and that we can use this next year to really work towards increasing action and further implementation. And highlight a couple specific steps that we could take um, and that I see as the most pressing, but really welcome the dialogue with the panelists and the audience to hear about what other tangible steps uh, we collectively need to make to make sure we're, we're supporting and building climate smart food systems. First and foremost, I, I'd say mobilizing climate finance, we have to continue to work on doing this for smallholder farmers and producers. Um, things, tangible things we could do is encourage private sector app partners to think about joining this prepare call to action um, that I've just mentioned and considering uh, consider joining the aim for C innovation sprints um, that also we just flagged and, and we'll drop uh, sort of the how to join in the chats. And, and as you all know, in the ag space, we know there's not enough, especially for women farmers, enough finance for, for women farmers or smallholder farmers writ large. And if we can crowd in more climate finance to do more climate smart practices, we can be solving two problems at once. If we can really um, unlock more climate finance for good practices that help improve yields, help increase food security, as also dealing with adaptation and help farmers deal with adaptation and, and mitigation where appropriate. And I'd really encourage partners, listen closely to our next speaker, um, Ann Spar, who's gonna tell us more about um, an exciting new uh, tool we have at, uh, called the Climate Finance for Development Accelerator, about how to engage really on the climate finance and ag space. 
Um, Secondly, other areas where I think we can be leaning in um, and looking over the next year and towards COP28 and build off momentum from, from this recent COP is in the food loss and waste space. Uh, US government and USAID is significantly elevating our work in, in food loss and waste. As we know, reducing food loss and waste, it doesn't just reduce methane emissions, which is a horrible greenhouse gas emission. It also makes perishable nutrient dense foods available and affordable and gets more food in people's bellies. Um, and we're working to leverage and expand existing programming at USAID um, in, in this space. But there's also important policy work that can be done to, so we're encouraging governments and partners to really think about their work in this space, again, including in policy spaces where we can think about changes we can make on our NDCs and NAPs or how we can target and measure the food loss and waste in countries and then work on acting to reduce where um, um, there is uh, significant waste or loss. Um, and and how we can um, how much we can do by the next COP to really make a, a tangible momentum in this space. Third is on nutrition. It was exciting that we had this launch of the ICANN, the Egyptian and WHO initiative. Really positive, but think we need to build on this effort, um, especially as we know that there's growing impacts of climate change on nutrition of food. And globally, NDCs are really focusing on nutritional impacts. And I challenge us to think through what we need to do now and throughout 2023 to really push um, and safeguard the nutrition of future generations um, and what tangible steps we can take to, to advance um, nutritional security. And that all ties into this last point on, on policy. What can we do to make sure NDCs and NAPs are fully taking food security into consideration? Um, Emily Weeks will speak um, uh, very eloquently about this. And uh, what we can, what more we should do to help advance policy changes that bring food and agriculture into NDCs and NAPs, and how we can support the implementation of these good policies. Um, I will, I'll stop there, but eager to hear from others on their thoughts and how we can tangibly move forward to make sure we're really building resilience and mitigation action into the climate crisis and in within our food systems. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Anne, for those insights and those really tangible opportunities for um, action moving forward. So really appreciate that. Um, I will now introduce our next speaker. Anne Spar is an international development professional, passionate about sustainability with 20 years of experience designing and overseeing initiatives to help people live healthier, more productive and more independent lives. Uh, she currently serves as the Chief of Party for USAID's Climate Finance for Development Accelerator, a $250 million initiative designed to develop and scale partnerships and investment solutions to achieve transformational change in countries where USAID works. So exactly touching on some of the action items that Anne was mentioning. So really looking forward to this. Great, thank you so much, uh, Caitlin, for the introduction and Anne for um, the nice segue, I think, into my presentation. Um, and, th and thank you again to uh, the Bureau and AgriLinks for this opportunity to talk a little bit more about USAID's, one of the USAID's newest tools for building resiliency in agriculture and food systems, uh, the Climate Finance for Development Accelerator. Um, as Caitlin uh, noted, I'm Anne Spar, I'm the Chief of Party for the Accelerator. Uh, which is designed to mobilize uh, at least 2.5 billion in public and private climate investments by 2030. And these climate investments will fund a range of climate change mitigation and adaptation activities focused on scaling up the transition to an equitable and resilient net zero economy. Um, as Ann mentioned, the accelerator was launched at, at COP27. It's part of a suite of initiatives um, that really seek to mobilize financial resources for climate adaptation and mitigation priorities in an inclusive and equitable way. Um, so the overarching goal of, our, of the Accelerator is to enable and support USAID missions and public and private sector partners to understand and design evidence-based solutions that respond to gaps and barriers in local climate finance ecosystems that currently prevent the deployment of effective climate finance at scale. Um, and our work hinges on developing solutions that crowd in rather than crowd out local climate finance ecosystems actors. So what does this mean? It means empowering local actors, marginalized communities, underrepresented groups to structure and access climate finance and to lead the effort to meet climate goals. Um, the accelerator will do this through co-creation with a really diverse cross-section of actors, um, partnership matchmaking, capacity building, to develop de-risking strategies optimal to each country and each local context. And de-risking could look like pairing technical assistance facilities that ensure private investors or financial institutions see a real return on their investments, 
in new enterprises or technologies. It could look like um, assisting funds to structure investments in a way that enable investors to see a clearer path to exit and therefore are more, um, more eager to enter. Um, another important goal that we have under the, under the accelerator is really mobilizing more, more finance for adaptation finance. Um, and while adaptation finance is increasing, it's still only about 7% of total climate finance. Um, so our goal is to have at least one third of the capital that we mobilize um, uh, really go towards adaptation uh, activities and goals. Um, another goal that we have, and I think I alluded to this, is just really ensuring that underrepresented groups, including women, youth, indigenous groups, uh, ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, have greater access to information and tools to support their engagement in local climate finance ecosystems and greater access to finance overall. Um, I should I should clarify for our mission colleagues that this is a buy-in mechanism. It's similar to invest or catalyze, which you may have heard about. It really streamlines the activity development process um, and convenes a broad range of implementing partners and provides expert advisory services to design effective programs and facilities that help countries meet their nationally determined contributions and or implement their national adaptation plans. Um, we don't necessarily have a pool of central funding um, to fund activities. Um, and so we're really looking to our mission colleagues um, to, to bring those resources and really utilize this as a tool to test and iterate climate finance solutions that um, with relatively small amounts of, of mission funding that can really complement uh, existing bilateral activities in the agriculture and food system space. Um, so next slide. Um, and we have a really broad and uh, scope and mandate, which is exciting because we can work along the, this entire spectrum that you see here of climate finance from grants and concessional capital to even debt for nature swaps. Um, and it gives us the ability to support farmers, agribusinesses, input suppliers, insurers, buyers in a variety of ways and at all points along value chains to really strengthen food systems and, and supply chains. Um, and so, you know, we all know that what we eat, the seeds that get planted, how they're grown, how crops are shipped, um, all, along all of, along each step of the chain, um, there's really exciting innovations going on that could reduce climate impacts in the agriculture industry while improving the efficiency and resiliency of food systems. And Anne alluded to methane reduction. I think, um, you know, I was just listening to a news program about this really, um, interesting farmer in Canada who noticed that when he fed his cow seaweed, um, that it drove up milk production because the vitamins and minerals in the seaweed were really um, supporting uh, that, that higher uptake of, of, of those things and, and that milk production. But he also found that it made them less gassy. Um, and so he started sort of testing and iterating and found out that a certain type of seaweed actually um, could nearly eliminate all methane emissions from cows. And that's actually super important because a cow can produce almost the same amount of uh, emissions as a small car each year. Um, and so he started a company, started testing and producing seaweed seed that um, those tests are now actually um, be the varieties are being tested in Vietnam. Um, other companies and other countries like Mexico are testing similar concepts. Um, but all of those innovations um, that, you know, address things like increasing agricultural productivity while also reducing emissions, they need financing to get off the ground um, and reach commercial viability. And that's really where we come in. So speaking first, and we can go to the next slide, um, to that, um, to blended finance, which um, we, you know, we see as sort of a tool to use relatively small amounts of, of USAID funds and uh, to really catalyze, um, it's catalytic capital, to lower the overall cost of capital to further protect investors. Um, and so in terms of agriculture and food systems, you know, we know we have to help farmers in uh, across value chains really adapt to sort of to ever warming climates, to more frequent, more intense um, storms and climate variability. Uh, and one of the ways that the accelerator can really support USAID missions and their partners is to facilitate these types of blended finance structures um, that couple a couple, you know, a small amount of grant capital to offset certain risks for private investors and companies um, who may be interested in, in investing in new systems or approaches or technologies that improve ag, um, ag productivity while also reducing emissions um, and also building resiliency. So this could look like, you know, for example, I think you see in this slide, it could look like 
um, fronting the cost or funding the cost of pre-feasibility studies or project preparation. It could be providing seed capital for early stage innovations or, you know, linking up with um, our partners at the DFC to, um, to provide guarantees, um, insurance type credit enhancements, um, or even technical uh, assistance facilities to support investees so that investors um, feel that those investments are less risky. Um, so a good example of this actually happened on USAID's strategic investment activity in Uganda, um, where USAID helped um, a local partner, uh, iGravity, um, uh, for Venture South uh, Uganda, uh, which is a um, an impact investor, and they helped them raise about two hundred thousand for debt finance, um, and so they could then provide uh, to farmers receivables financing. Um, that would help them be able to acquire um, solar irrigation systems or other energy solutions um, to maximize water usage um, in the face of warming temperatures. Uh, another example, a really interesting example, is the case of Pool Advisors, which is a crop insurance provider in Africa, and it received uh, support from Mercy Corps. Uh, they have an agri they had an agrofin program. Um, to increase the uptake of insurance pro uh, products among smallholder farmers in Zambia, Malawi, Kenya, and Nigeria. Um, and um, thanks to this support, Pula Advisors was able to build a track record, complete its first seed funding round, and eventually, um, you know, a few years later, it actually closed a Series A investment of about $6 million, and it now insures over 700,000 farmers across these four countries. Um, and it serves, you know, a, a range of, of governments, um, large agribusiness, uh, uh, ag large agribusinesses, other funds. Um, so there's a lot that we can do with these sort of blended finance mechanisms. Um, and we can also work in the enabling environment space with a really, you know, relatively small amount of investment. Uh, I think the USAID's Green uh, Invest Asia activity collaborated with a global cocoa processor um, to develop the first global sustainable coconut charter to strengthen the industry collaboration on sustainable coconut and coconut oil production. And, um, you know, these efforts actually helped mitigate the environmental impact of coconut and coconut oil production, as well as help coconut farmers improve uh, their farm productivity and their self-reliance. Um, so moving on to the next slide and maybe the next bucket along this spectrum. Um, we can talk a little bit about carbon markets as well. I know there's a lot of interest in carbon markets. A lot of people are talking about it. Um, the demand is really growing, um, not just in, in terms of voluntary compliance markets, but in, uh, or sorry, voluntary carbon markets, but also compliance markets. Um, and and that, that growth is going to continue. Um, I should point out carbon offsets are not a solution to climate change in themselves. They have to be coupled with actions to reduce emissions. We all know that. Um, but they can be really important sources of additional revenues for farmers who make commitments to conserving forests on their lands or adopt regenerative agri agriculture projects. And so, for example, in Colombia, USAID investments starting roughly a decade ago um, led to thousands of hectares of forest conserved or restored. And now, um, to date, uh, have generated nearly 27 million in revenues for indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities in some in some of the most remote and conflict affected uh, areas of Colombia, um, those communities have continued to maintain and advance those carbon projects while reinvesting in conservation and reforestation and community infrastructure and new enterprises. Um, and so it's really exciting to see what a, a relatively small um, investment by USAID has done over a decade to really support that carbon markets uh, industry. Um, and Monsanto, Bayer, Bayer, others, they're starting to pay farmers to adopt regenerative and climate smart agriculture pra practices that sequester higher levels of carbon in the soil in exchange for carbon credits. And so we can also work with them um, through this model. And then next slide. Uh, we can also work with traditional providers of commercial finance, asset managers, private equity firms to help them understand how to integrate climate analysis and climate goals into their transactions. And this will be critical for infrastructure projects, but also for agriculture and agribusiness finance providers who, so that they can more accurately assess climate risks, as well as see the new opportunities that are emerging to finance adaptive and climate smart practices. Um, and we can also help price in tools like crop or flood insurance 
to help borrowers weather the impacts of climate change. Um, we're also seeing our private sector partners make really sizable commitments in um, greening and making their supply chains more sustainable. And so we can partner with them in this effort. Uh, for example, the Land Innovation Fund, which was started with a $30 million commitment from Cargill, invests in innovative companies in South America that help minimize the impacts of soil production on forests and native vegetation and keep biomes across the region while increasing productivity um, in the soy supply chain. Um, and we can go to the next uh, slide. So uh, there is a lot that we can do. Um, we have a huge challenge in front of us and we recognize that we uh, need all of you who are on this call um, to help us join forces to reach our climate goals. One of the things that we're doing under um, the accelerator is building a uh, climate finance investment network. Um, and so um, we have established a partnership portal as an entry for private sector, um, foundations, other organizations um, that are interested in supporting and providing catalytic support for climate investments aligned with USAID objectives and Paris Agreement commitments. Um, we want you all to join the accelerator and be part of this. Um, and we can go to the next slide actually for how folks can join. You'll see the QR code here. You can also go to climatelinks.org um, slash project slash CFDA to access our partnership portal. You fill out a quick questionnaire uh, about your organization to become part of our network. We will keep you engaged through learning and knowledge activities. Um, and we'll also, the network will also serve as a hub uh, for opportunities to work alongside us in CFDA. Um, and so thank you. I just want to say thank you. Um, and we hope all of you will join the network um, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Anne. That is a really impressive initiative and you're all taking on quite a lot um, and appreciate the, the, the year effort to build in inclusive development and into everything, all which hopefully we can loop back to at the end. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to move to our next speaker, who is Claudia Ringler. She's the Deputy Division Director of the Environment and Production Technology Division at the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFRI, where her research focuses on global water and food security, gender and water and energy and gender and climate linkages, as well as on the synergies of climate change adaptation. So um, over to Claudia, who's going to talk more about women and inclusive development as well. Thanks. Yep. Thank you very much for this great introduction and also to the previous speakers, because as uh, I guess, again, I've seen a lot of segues here. So my uh, short intervention focuses on a climate metric that I believe we need to really measure progress on adaptation and mitigation of women in agriculture. Next slide. Between 1990 and 2022, you know, the IPCC has released these six uh, great and comprehensive assessment reports. There's also 14 special reports and at least one on water and one on land use. However, you know, if you ask any policymaker in any country, what share of your farmers, including women farmers, are adapted and are mitigating in the agriculture sector? I think no one can answer because we just don't know. Most of the metrics that exist, for example, on mitigation, they're devoid of people. They're just greenhouse gases, you know, emission reductions. We really don't know what's going on. So, I, so that's why I think USAID uh, has decided to, to invest in a gendered adaptation and mitigation metric, at least to dig into what is needed uh, and to try to listen, listen to uh, women farmers, what they think uh, means, what adaptation means to them, what mitigation means to them. So this is just a few motivational statements here. We do need, I think as you've already, I think very clearly heard, we do need adaptation and mitigation, uh, not just to address climate change, but also to ensure food security and nutrition. We don't do it, we know our nutritional outcomes are worsening. And we also, in, within this adaptation and mitigation uh, action, we do need a focus on women farmers. Why do we need that? Because a, gen, a gender blind approach or an approach that you know, is very generically uh, supporting mitigation and adaptation action can actually worsen inequities. It will uh, worsen inequities and it will therefore, and as a result, reduce, resili uh, reduce resilience and also grow 
food insecurity. A metric, uh, you know, should be very simple, but it needs to be based within an appropriate and probably a more complex gender sensitive framework that addresses climate, the signal, the sensitivities, the response options and the outcomes. So we have to consider adaptation and mitigation within a larger framework. And of course, without such metrics and indicators, you know, you, you ask a country, uh, has adaptation improved? In fact, not only will they not know the answer, it might actually have worsened or, you know, entry points on where we need to target this financing on uh, the presentation we've just heard will not be known. And yes, there are a lot of guidance tools out there, uh, but they're generally probably too complex and they're not really uh, adopted. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. Next slide. Yeah, I just wanted to add one uh, quick point here. I mean, yes, everyone, I think in the previous presentations has been clear that we do need adaptation and mitigation. So not just adaptation for low and middle income countries. And here are just again a few reasons why. Um, we know that a lot of these mitigation strategies that are being promoted, uh, for example, in the renewable energy space, they're also key adaptation solutions. We actually want uh, women and men farmers adopt mitigation strategies that are good for their adaptation. As an example, biogas uh, systems for cooking, solar palms, precision agricultural practices, they, they reduce emissions, but they're also very important for adaptation. They actually improve uh, food security and food production. Additionally, uh, you know, adopting some of those uh, solutions can actually grow income op opportunities through carbon credits. So Self-Employed Women's Association, uh, with 1.2 million uh, women farmer members in India, for example, uh, was able to get uh, carbon credits uh, for their biogas program. And they now have a backlog of 5,000 women farmers who want to, you know, who want to adopt the biogas systems. So uh, it would be great to maybe to link the, uh, also some financing uh, to this intervention. And they're actually also looking into the seaweed option because uh, yeah, I think a good third of their farmers um, are in, in the dairy, you know, uh, dairy operations, and they're all very interested in, in getting into seaweed uh, feeding. And Gujarat, for example, is, is, a, is, is on the coast. So I think there's a lot of great opportunities there. Um, at the same time, we know that many, many mitigation strategies, such as biofuel, bioenergy crops, uh, carbon capture and storage, and some livestock management, and obviously some changes proposed on fertilizer use, can actually negative, negatively affect adaptation outcomes in low and middle income countries. They can negatively uh, affect food security and nutrition, and also water security, because obviously bioenergy crops do also uh, use water uh, to, 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 to grow. So that is another reason why low and middle income countries and women and men farmers have to have, to have a voice uh, in mitigation as well. And of course, you know, mitigation when done well uh, is is certainly also a food security investment because it lowers, um, you yeah, know, it lowers uh, temperatures or it lowers the increase in temperature and, and uh, increases productivity. Next slide, please. So yeah, just a few examples of why uh, the gender blind adaptation that unfortunately we still see happening. Uh, pretty much uh, everywhere, uh, why it uh, increase, increases inequity and, and is really bad for food security and nutrition. An example again on, on, on livestock management, uh, I think, you know, improving, um, reducing methane emissions in livestock management is essential for, for food security. But if it's not done well, if you do not talk to women farmers, if you don't involve them in some of the funding to improve uh, methane management, then we actually, you know, we actually can in, uh, reduce their uh, income and, and their nutrition and their family's income and nutrition because women are so essential in livestock management everywhere. And, and but particularly in India, where 80 percent of the work in the livestock sector, as an example, is, is, is done by women. Another, I think, um, important uh, climate adaptation strategy that's increasingly being promoted is climate information systems, uh, generally over mobile phones, smartphones. Again, it's very important, but we have to be aware uh, that women are much, much less likely to have access to, to mobile, mobile um, um, 
applications and to smartphones and therefore they actually will not get access to that information so we need to overcome these challenges if we seriously want to um, be gen gender sensitive in the provision of climate information services and finally we heard solar irrigation pumps as an important uh, finance and an investment option and we fully agree with that but again uh, a lot of these um, finance financial tools require land title as collateral and we know that women uh, own less land than men but not only that even if they own the land their knowledge uh, and understanding of, of what land rights entail is very limited or very different so for example here only 29 percent of of women landowners they said we own the land but only 29 percent of, of women say that they can use the land as collateral whereas 60 percent of men think so so we have to provide more capacity building next slide please So what are some of the elements that such a metric should entail? And I hope all of you, you know, uh, in this session can, can provide some additional elements that such a metric should, should, uh, should consider. But what we think is important is that we have something like a scorecard where progress is really measure, measurable at the national level, because there we have the key actors and some key investors sit there. And it also will allow for comparison across. Um, we also think it's very important that this metric considers gender climate change vulnerabilities. Again, I think I've tried to make the case of why we have to focus on women farmers and, and not just uh, uh, use these gender blind approaches. And I think it's very important that we talk to women uh, across different positions of decision making. Of course, we also have to elevate women. I think that alone is probably an important indicator um, for a gender sensitive uh, adaptation mitigation process, but we also really have to involve them in, in developing them. And finally, I think it's important that such a metric shows where women make key contributions both to adaptation and mitigation. Next slide, please. As I've mentioned, uh, it's very important that a metric links to a framework. And here, uh, GCAN, the Gender Climate Change Nutrition Integration Initiative, uh, supported by USAID, has already developed a gender sensitive um, framework that starts with the climate signals, um, the gender vulnerabilities, and resi and the resilience cap capabilities, capacities, the response options, and the gender differentiated well-being outcomes. And we strongly believe that a metric actually has to uh, reflect all of these areas because we can't just say, oh, we're you know, we, ha we happen to adopt some agroforestry practices. So this is a country or these are women or men, you know, who are seriously engaged in adaptation and mitigation, because maybe the climate signal doesn't suggest that that's an appropriate option. We might not generate uh, desired well-being outcomes for nutrition, for example. Uh, it might actually be a maladaptation. You would be surprised how many wrong trees are being grown uh, in, uh, as carbon offset in the world. I think that alone would be an interesting article. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, an example of, of exposure you know, that such a metric uh, could entail based on, on data that, that are already available is simply you know, what is the sectoral distribution of employment or engagement in, in the crop and livestock sectors uh, across low and middle income countries. And here, this slide shows as an example that women um, dominate in, in livestock activities in both Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, and they happen to spend more of their time as compared to men on cereals in Mali and Zambia. So if you want to be serious and intentional about involving women or ensuring that women have access to adaptation and mitigation opportunities in these countries, we actually also have to focus on these subsectors in agriculture. Next slide. Yeah, this slide already takes another, as you might remember, another uh, component of the framework, uh, looking at gendered vulnerabilities, and it actually combines climate hazards, uh, gendered vulnerabilities, and gender inequities. And what we see here, I mean, basically red or orange type colors are where, uh, again, if you want to make a difference for women in agriculture, those are the countries we should be focusing more on. And unsurprisingly, I think those are the countries, um, yeah, the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and, and IFPE and other organizations are already focusing on, largely in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and in South Asia. So that is where, uh, women, women's vulnerabilities are larger than those of men in the agriculture sector. Next slide, please. 
think we are, uh, yes, we are basically already uh, coming to an end here. So we are still at the beginning uh, of developing this metric. Uh, we please, you know, contact us, um, join the GCAN newsletter and, and let us know if you would like to contribute to the metric, we are planning to do some engagement with stakeholders and also with women and men farmers, most likely in Kenya in the next couple of months. And we hope to report back uh, on our thoughts about the gendered metric. Um, and we hope you know, to get some broader adoption um, as part of national adaptation and, and mitigation processes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claudia. Really appreciate that presentation and you flagging the real need to make sure people and especially women are at the center of not only our engagements and programs, but our, our metrics. Um, so thank you so much for that. We're going to move to our next speaker, um, who is going to be talking about efforts on the ground, to scale out various, um, various practices. Um, so Dr. Ben, Odiam Mena is the Chief of Party of the Feed the Future Nigeria Agricultural Extension and Advisory Services Activity. He has over 25 years of experience leading efforts to strengthen agriculture value chains, improve public and private sector extension advisory services, and generate impacts for smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, he also initiated and promoted private extension delivery services in Nigeria and is one of the architects of Nigeria's new extension policy is working closely with agricultural venture capital stakeholders to scale these efforts. So very excited to have you here today and hear more about your work. So over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, colleagues, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you on in this platform. Um, extension activity, like you have been told, is a USID funded initiative that works with uh, micro, small and medium enterprises to increase the productivity and income of of uh, 2 million smallholder farmers. Next slide. The activity basically um, um, uses uh, what we call an innovative lean methodology to come up with the most impactful practices, including climate smart uh, agricultural practices as business solutions to be able to tackle the farmers uh, hindrances in productivity enhancement and the income. So our entry point here is to identify the MIPs, the most impactful practices, and the which, of course, has strong element of climate uh, uh, smart practices, and, uh, and then engage MSMEs to be able to influence the smallholder farmers to adopt the, um, the climate smart uh, practices. Uh, geographically here, like you can see, we are in seven out of the 36 states of Nigeria, working along the five value chain commodities of aquaculture, cowpea, soybean, rice, and maize. Next slide. Now, like I told you, the, our entry point is the business solution. And of course, you cannot talk about business solutions in agriculture without talking about uh, climate smart solutions, climate smart tools that help the farmers to be able to develop resilience to menace of climate change. So in this case, we have about 33 most impactful practices. Out of that, we have four that addresses our farmers or help farmers to adapt and be, and, and get, be resilient to climate changes. Next slide. The, the, um, our four climate smart practices uh, the improved seeds, of course, we have rice, maize, cowpea, and soybean improved seeds. These improved seeds, of course, are more, help the farmers to be more resilient to extreme weather conditions and the pests. Um, what is most important is that it's not just to, um, to control these uh, effects of weather changes, but it is also, there is also a nexus in increasing farmers' productivity and income. And that is the incentive that makes these farmers, and the name is means that provide extension services around these climate smart practices to be able to do that. For the improved seeds, for instance, we are having an increased uh, yield of uh, two metric tons to 3.5 metric tons on the average, in for rice, maize, and uh, 
and the cowpea. And of course, uh, with a profit margin of about uh, 50% from 21% on the conventional practices. We also have integrated the nutrient management as one of our climate smart agricultural practices, which specifically include soil testing and the optimal fertilizer use and the integration of use of organic fertilizer. And these are specifically to respond, of course, with what's going on presently in, in, in Ukraine and, uh, and the and, um, Russia crisis, as well as also pro devastating flood effect that visited Nigeria in the last one month. Um, it, is, it is instrumental here to let you know that now farmers will like to go and test their soils before even they make the choice of uh, their fertilizers. And these are increasing nitrogen efficiencies in the soils and of course among the farmers, decreasing contamination of the surface and the groundwater. What is, you can see, what we have observed is that the use of these climate smart practices have been able to increase product, uh, profit by more than 45% for the smallholder farmer. Then we also have the third um, um, climate smart practices practice, which is integrated pest management. Here we are looking at, uh, we are strongly promoting use of uh, smart weather reader. So farmers tend to look at the, what the weather says before they move to the farms in order not to waste their resources, their mega resources. We're also looking at uh, promoting biopest control solutions as well as integrating cultural practices that help the farmers or confer resilience to climate change in the practices of these farmers. Uh, we, in the context of uh, mitigation, we are also uh, uh, promoting systems of rice intensification. Of course, this is an upcoming uh, activities. We are working with the Nigeria Links project that is being promoted by DFID to be able to see how we can begin to also reduce uh, greenhouse emissions as well as also, of course, by increasing aeration in the activities of the farmers uh, promoting early maturity. Here, um, what we have also noticed is that the use of a uh, system of rice intensification also almost uh, increases uh, yield by more than 70% with also a profit margin that moved farmers' uh, um, efforts from 26, from 25% to about uh, 65%. Next slide. Yeah, the, uh, what is also instrumental to let you know here is that it is not just enough to come up with the uh, climate smart uh, uh, practices. There is also issue of uh, accessibility, issue of uh, affordability, and also uh, availability, which hinders the smallholder farmers to use these uh, uh, smart practices, climate smart practices, to enhance their productivity and income. It is in this context that one of our strategies is mobilizing the MSMEs to be able to extend these uh, climate smart uh, products and services to smallholder farmers. So presently, we are working, we have networked about 260 partner MSMEs who are delivering these services to more than 180,000 smallholder farmers. And these MSMEs, because they are seeing value in the work they do, engaging large number of farmers, use, building the clientele of farmers. Most of them have more, invested more than 3 million in expanding climate smart services to the smallholder farmers. It is also not important here to let you know that um, we invest in climate financing. And uh, to do that, we try as much as possible to um, use bundled value chain agricultural credit financing to be able to reach uh, smallholder farmers. The MSMEs that are engaged in these activities have mobilized more than $8 million to be able to um, provide these climate smart products and services to large number of farmers that are in their network. And uh, we are also using the weather index insurance uh, to 
which is presently gaining traction as a risk reduction instrument uh, following, of course, uh, to uh, recent uh, flood that devastated Nigeria. We have started to integrate also weather index insurance in the activities of the smallholder farmers. And uh, of course, financial institutions have jumped into this new approach to see how also to secure their funding and the serve large number of uh, women that uh, tend to embrace these uh, climate smart tools. Next slide. Yeah, the um, one of the things we are doing is that uh, we noticed that um, while we came up with uh, improved seeds as one of the practices that uh, help the farmers to develop resilience and also adapt to climate change, uh, we also noticed some element of lack of trust and transparency among the seed producers and smallholder farmers, which tend to hinder the mass adoption of the climate smart uh, seeds. And in this context, we began to promote community seed systems that enable MSMEs that live close to the smallholder farmers to produce these uh, climate smart seeds, even with the participation of the smallholder farmers in their villages. In doing that, we were able to uh, promote traceability, restore confidence and trust among the parties. And these are prom uh, helping the MSMEs, especially women MSMEs, to reach out to the large number of smallholder farmers in the villages. So in this context, um, using the community seed production systems, the women, most importantly, women and youth, have embraced this approach even uh, investing as large as 820,000 US dollars uh, in the pre last production uh, season, in the last production season. And um, so far, uh, prior to now, we have also recorded up to 1.4 million uh, sales, dollar sales in the use of improved seed. And these are transactions that we are generated from the use of climate smart practices by rural women, you know, in their dealing with the smallholder farmers. Uh, an example of that is uh, Mrs. Dockers, who you are seeing here in the slide, who are developing, who have developed various climate smart messages, including soil testing, as like I told you, and weather reading uh, tools to be able to engage our farmers, use of biofertilizers, you know, mechanized land preparation and the input credit financing uh, to be able to reach these farmers. This slide just tries to let you know that um, we are not just um, engaging men alone, but we are also having biased, can I say biased attention to women and youth who are actually very close to rare farmers. And of course, who also have won the confidence and trust of these women farmers in the rural areas. Next slide. Yeah, the, what drives our intervention is also sustainability. So in the course of uh, implement, implementation, while we have successful approaches, we also try to ensure that we institutionalize these approaches in a manner that even after our intervention, these, uh, the practices of uh, using climate smart agricultural services will continue to be with smallholder farmers and MSMEs. In this context, we have developed, uh, uh, we are forming and strengthening community of practices that uh, with membership from both public and private sectors who sit on quarterly basis to look at the lessons and experiences of the performance of these climate smart practices in the rural areas. And of course, like I said before, we engage with MSMEs, but we also try as much as possible not to do it individually. We develop cohorts of MSMEs who have interest in climate smart agriculture and of course, uh, business solutions from other most impactful practices to sit together to discuss how to take the successes they are recording from these resilient practices to scale. And um, thanks to COVID, we are also using video extension tools to be able to extend the successes of our 
climate smart agricultural practices, especially improved seed, and the, of course, soil testing, that it has become a game changer in the current practices of agriculture in Nigeria. And the part of the institutionalization we pursue is also to develop in innovative uh, uh, public-private partnership platforms, you know, where the MSMEs and the smallholder farmers sit on the same table in equal footing to engage with government to begin to discuss how they can take the successes of their climate smart agriculture to scale. A case in point is in Cross River where uh, smallholder farmers who are engaged in fish production are engaging with government and uh, of course ADPs are the big players in the agricultural sector to develop climate smart fish hatchery unit that uh, includes solar power facilities, um, resilient infrastructure like uh, drainages, and uh, of course greenhouses to be able to shield away um, proliferation of uh, diseases and the pests that could result from drastic climate change. change. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, this slide, which of course marks the end of this presentation, is uh, demonstrates um, the nexus we try to portray uh, between productivity enhancement and uh, income for smallholder farmers in the agricultural practices and adaptation uh, uh, to climate uh, uh, smart uh, seeds. You can see how good that seed looks. The farmers are very happy to bring their, their uh, colleagues to the field. Of course, with um, the MSMEs that are selling these seeds, coming with the extension agents, taking this uh, uh, field as, a, as a, a case in point to be able to reach out to smallholder farmers. And it will interest you to know that, like I said, we are using the video enabled tools to be able to extend our messages. This slide was basically picked from the video clip that was sent out by a woman, MSMEs, to numerous uh, women farmers that, are, that engage in soybean production. So with this slide, I want to thank you so much for listening and I wish we have more time for you to know more about extension activity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. And it, this is an incredibly impressive effort to scale out um, climate smart practices. So we really appreciate you walking us through that and everything you've done to both scale out the financing and also make sure that you're doing it through community. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to transition to our last speaker, um, Emily Weeks. Dr. Emily Weeks is a senior policy advisor in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security in the Office of Policy Analysis and Engagement. She provides leadership across the agency in climate, natural resource management, land resource governance, and resilience and food security. And she currently leads the Comprehensive Action for Climate Change Initiative, which she'll talk more about today. It's a global initiative that supports local organizations to work with key stakeholders at the country level to meet nationally determined contribution and national adaptation plan commitments. So over to you, Em. Thank you, Caitlin. And thank you to the team today for this session. It's uh, very insightful and helpful in looking at our next steps post COP, which is what I will speak to today specifically in regards to the NDCs and MAPs, National Determined Contributions and National Adaptation Plans. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so just providing a little bit of an overview, uh, some context in regards to what countries have NDCs and MAPs and what targets are being set within these plans. So as of September, we had 169 countries that had NDCs and 40 countries with national adaptation plans. The majority of the NDCs aim to reduce emissions by 7% compared to our 2019 levels. However, emissions need to decline by 43% to reach our 1.5 degree target. And I think we're all familiar with 
our increased challenge and the need to really start looking at implementation and climate action. Next slide, please. So 77% of NDCs include greenhouse reductions and 96% are these are sector specific targets. Also noting that NDCs now are more inclusive of adaptation being as noted with our previous speakers, a very critical component of our climate action in the countries that we particularly at USAID work in. 53% of NDCs include estimates of climate finance, and uh, we had a very good talk today regarding our new mechanism supporting increasing mobilizing finance uh, support across our, our partner countries. Next slide, please. So we still face a challenge in regards to implementing and meeting our, our climate targets, and as Anne noted, the key effort now is focused on implementation, moving away from setting more targets, developing more strategies, uh, but now trying to look at how we actually implement the strategies that we have recently created, and specifically in relation to meeting those NDC and NAP targets. So despite the strong political will, we are still remains the challenge of implementation of these NDCs and adaptation plans. Many countries still require technical and financial assistance, as well as capacity building and technologies to help them with their implementation phase. There are some key legal gaps and policy gaps that need to be addressed in regards to capacity. As mentioned, we have technical, financial, and institutional gaps that need support. And we also need to look at broader collaboration and, and, and coordination around learning from existing projects and activities and building out research and additional knowledge products, including supporting measurements and reporting and verification, and developing approaches that uh, ensure accountability to helping countries meet targets. So one thing, again, to note that there is increased synergies between NDCs and at NAPs and the Sustainable Development Goals. And the new initiative that I will speak to in a moment aims to bring this all together, both focusing on coordination across the different needs in regards to mitigation and adaptation, but also focusing on a localized approach, supporting country-led investments and implementation plans. Next slide, please. So what do we need? So we need to continue to support the implementation planning and policy coherence, as just mentioned, and continue to build significant policy to continue to address significance in policy and coherence, and that's particularly across regions. And again, one thing that I will speak to in our CASI uh, approach is that we're working across regions, trying to create cohesion across different countries within those regions. While we have targets and timeframes, we still need implementation arrangements and, of course, increased financing for that implementation. Again, still focusing on that alignment between NAPs and NDCs is crucial, and having externally facing political commitments through the internally facing NAPs and sectoral plans. Next slide, please. So what is USA doing? So we are, as you are aware, have our new climate strategy, of which we have outlined key targets that we aim to meet. One of those targets is, is providing support across our partner countries for NDCs and NAPs implementation. Our goal is to try and support 80 countries, with 40 of these countries being systematic change. We are setting indicators and targets for achieving CO2 reductions, and that includes targets such as reduction uh, it measured in hectares and number of people that are supported. Again, as already discussed today, heavy emphasis on mobilizing finance and developing investment plans, and specifically to support NDC commitments. We're also increasing our ambition, supporting a broader systematic change, and a very strong emphasis, as mentioned earlier, on localization and supporting locally-led policy agendas and implementation. Next slide, please. So that brings me to the Comprehensive Action for Climate Change Initiative, CASI which is now global in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Next slide, please. 
CASI aims to support countries in implementing their NDCs and NAPs, and it aims to deliver on the commitments that this administration announced at COP26 and also at COP27. That includes PREPARE, the Climate Ambition Initiative, commitments made by our administrative power, and also supporting the targets set in the climate strategy. Next slide, please. CASI was established to advance the implementation in NDC and NAPS through technical and analytical support, capacity development, and inclusive and evidence-based policy dialogues. As mentioned, it is now a global initiative. It was originally established in Africa in coordination with the African Union. It has expanded to Asian and Latin America and the Caribbean post COP27. It is a response to high demand from our partner countries and also our missions to develop and meet NDC goals and determine avenues for financing and building capacity to meet these demands. It also works in collaboration with the NDC partnership and the NDC partnership aims to create coordination across donors, allowing us to help meet uh, country requests that come in in, in efforts to meet their adaptation and mitigation commitments. Next slides, please. So what is CASI? There are four pillars of work within CASI. This is also what we define as our pathway to success in helping with that implementation and also meeting targets set by countries. First pillar is clarifying ambitions and setting policy agendas. As mentioned, there is need for increased cohesion and for improved policy agendas. So we work to establish baselines, conduct stock taking, and then determine how we can support policy agendas and improve policy implementation. Second pillar is human and capacity and institutional infrastructure building. This includes local, regional, and national actors, and it also includes supporting data analytics and various tools to help with that capacity enhancement. Third pillar is facilitating implementation, aiming to help meet that zero carbon target and also support 500 million people across, uh, in, in particular through African leadership and other regional um, leadership, so across our regions. We're also aiming to support through our fourth pillar, the reporting and monitoring process by setting indic indicators, maintaining dialogues and ensuring that there is mutual accountability. Next slide, please. Our roadmap to success, as we noted, CASI is a call to action. We are focused on implementation. We work across the four pillars, as noted in the previous slide, clarifying ambitions, strengthening human capacity and institutional capacity, strengthening implementation, and tracking progress and monitoring. We, in, we started CASI with a few pilot countries in Africa, initially four countries, and now we're starting the scaling phase. We aim to work in 20 countries over the course of the year and continuing to build that implementation with targeting our goal of meeting the 80 countries that are set in our climate strategy. So just in summary, we do hope to achieve the overall goal of trying to work across the entire pipeline, working from policy all the way to action, working from setting those policy agendas to actually implementing programs and activities that help meet those targets and reduce carbon emissions and build resilience across our countries. With that, I will leave it, hand it back to Caitlin and uh, for, I think we're moving into question and answer. So thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, it's great to hear about that initiative, taking uh, the policy support uh, quest to action. So we are going to move into the Q&A section um, for a little bit short amount of time, so we won't be able to get to all of the questions. But what I've done is tried to pull up a couple, um, and we'll just do a quick round with the speakers. If everyone can just try to give um, like a one-minute answer, that would be fantastic. And um, so you guys can, we can take the slides down, and this panelists, if you can come on camera, that would be fantastic. Um, so. Given that everyone was, we've been talking a lot about inclusive development, central to our climate and ag efforts, 
Um, and we got a question from Derek um, in the chat also asking more about opportunities for youth to get involved in transforming African food systems, which I think um, that plus women and other um, underrepresented and marginalized groups. Um, we wanted to just do a round where we're talking a little bit more about that. So maybe I can just go in order of the speakers. Um, and and given that you talked about increasing, um, this is it for Anne um, Spar, sorry. Given that you mentioned increasing inclusion in, is a key goal of the accelerator, maybe you could talk a little bit more about how you envision um, the accelerator addressing the critical issues of gender equity and social inclusion and climate finance, which we know is a challenge. That's great. And I appreciate Claudia's presentation so much because I think she touched on so many of the ways that we can do this and so many of the barriers and challenges that we have to take into account when, especially when, when speaking about gender equity. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can do that the accelerator can do that really builds on um, previous work of USAID, CETA, others in the gender lens investing space. Um, and so I think that's really exciting. One of the first things that we are doing um, is with um, support from Amazon, the company, um, actually launching a climate gender equity fund uh, in the next several months um, to really uh, support uh, women entrepreneurs um, uh, in a variety of spaces, but in technology and agriculture in particular. Um, and so be on the lookout for more information about that. I think that um, providing that gender lens um, very initially in some of the work that we do is, is one that way that we can do that. And another thing that I think we need to do, and, and Claudia really alluded to this, is bringing and um, bringing uh, various partners to the table, women in particular, but also um, in our work, bringing indigenous groups, bringing ethnic minority groups, bringing people with disabilities to the table when we're designing facilities and when we're designing structures um, and designing solutions in general. Um, and so that's something I, I think that we can really do. I think USA did a very good job of this in Colombia when they were developing carbon markets, a big part of our work with USAID in that in that case was working with indigenous communities and Afro-Colombian communities so that they could really understand um, what carbon markets were, how the pricing worked, um, how, how they uh, had the verification process, the benefits, all of that, um, as well as what governance structures they needed to put in place, um, not in addition to existing governance structures that they had, but maybe how they could work through their existing governance structures to really develop that so that when revenues did flow in, that there was a, a solid way of managing them. So I think it's providing those tools as well um, and, um, and resources for, for um, a lot of our partners um, so that they, they know how to access these solutions. Thanks, Anne. That's really helpful. And yeah, turning it over to Claudia, you're obviously giving us a tool that we can we can use to help ourselves do better at this. So maybe you can talk more about the relevancy of that to USAID missions and our partners in terms of their efforts to improve inclusive development. And um, you also had a question that was asking about um, the focus on impacts on nutrition. And given how important that is, maybe if you want to touch on that. Over to you, Claudia. Yeah, so, you know, obviously we're starting with a pilot, so, <laughs> yeah, we are trying to really tease out uh, what needs to be included in a gender -sensi sensitive adaptation and mitigation metric, really drawing on on what's in the NDCs. We know that in low and middle income countries, you know, governments mention women and gender as an aspect, but then they, they again face these challenges, how to actually implement it and how to make it actionable. And so we hope that these um, metric that we're developing, I mean, will be used, can be used by governments and by, by, um, by, by missions and partners to just say, okay, yes, you know, we are considering not just uh, that it's an activity that's considered an adaptation activity, such as uh, we've heard SRI, we've heard uh, advanced seeds, uh, better fertilizer management, et cetera. So not just the activity, but how the activity uh, contributes to mitigation and to adaptation and how women um, farmers are being considered as well. So basically, you know, it's a, it's a little yardstick. I think that that's the idea. And as I said, we are starting uh, with some piloting in Kenya um, in the coming months, but we'll also provide a review of everything that's out there already um, on metrics. So I think that's the idea. And yes, nutrition, we were actually set up part of the global um, food security strategy, the last round where, you know, nutrition, uh, was an explicit goal and resilience. So how do those two things fit together? We know that climate change 
uh, adversely, um, you know, adversely impacts nutrition. We know that nutrition adversely impacts climate change, you know, depending on, on, on how, uh, uh, how we nourish ourselves. And so the, the, and we have, you know, looked at uh, a bunch of, um, a bunch of research topics, aflatoxins, um, nutrient leaching of crops, what extent diversification of production systems can improve nutrition on the farm. So there's many variables that matter. Um, and how we can be more um, intentional on nutrition in various adaptation investments, for example, irrigation. So, so those are, you know, some of the areas we've been focusing on. And definitely uh, now um, sustainable healthy diets are an active um, mitigation uh, action uh, in, in the latest IPCC reports. So there'll be a lot more coming down on the food system side and on the nutrition side, also on the mitigation side not just on the adaptation side. Thank you. Yeah, no, appreciate that. Thanks, Claudia. And that definitely links with what Anne Vaughn had highlighted, vision also towards COP28. So thank you for touching on that. Um, I'll move to um, Ben. Maybe you can touch on um, a little bit more detail on how the project's ensuring the inclusion of women in the delivery of those climate smart ag services. So I'm not seeing Ben on camera. Yeah. Um... Okay, good. Uh, thank you so much, Kat. You the, Yeah, um, for women inclusion, there are key things we try to um, uh, integrate in our implementation. First is that, uh, like I said before, the climate smart um, agricultural practices are part of our business solutions. And we only come up with these using our lean methodology. And the three methodology is a, a, is, is a, is a socio-economic analysis that involves a lot of stakeholders. So we cannot come up with the climate smart practices that have to respond to women without women being involved. So we engage as much as possible a lot of women out there who are actually participants in the agricultural space to be major decision makers in the selection and the validation of uh, uh, climate smart MIPs. That's one. Two, we also have um, a lot of women who have the skill and uh, expertise in engaging other women. And they have all these large uh, network of women around them. So we try as much as possible to directly target this type of people so that we be able to make sure that we focus using them focus on the uh, number of women out there in the rural communities producing these commodities we call, we we deal on. And the, the other as the other methodology or approach is the fact that the financial institution has actually been wary of financing agriculture because of the weather effects and the unpredictability of the outcome that will come from the field. So we are engaging the financial institutions in various uh, um, platforms to be able to see the gains that are coming out from these uh, um, interventions. And uh, some of them have also seen that it is important to uh, engage women to be able to deliver their financial services in the rural communities. So the inclusion of financial institutions is also making women to assess the climate smart uh, um, agricultural practices. And finally, it's about the schedule and the venue for engagement. We try to be very sensitive to ensuring that our venues and scales of engaging with the women and, the, and men are very responsive and friendly to women Choices. So these are some of uh, the practices or uh, approaches we use to be able to ensure that women are highly included in the choice of uh, climate smart agriculture. Thank you so much, Ben. Really appreciate you pulling out those very concrete examples. Um, we're running out of time, but I am going to continue with our round robin. But just to say that for those that do have to. There is a whole AgriLinks month related to climate and agriculture that's up from last month. So I will, but I'm going to keep doing the round robin for those that can stay, for those that can't. Check that out um, and I'll close in a couple.
Over to Emily Weeks. You had a question from Akanath who was asking about kind of coordination in terms of these policy efforts and really that coordination that's leading to successful implementation. And I thought you might be able to touch on that and also how CASI is advancing more localized efforts for climate action at the same time as doing this um, kind of broad high level coordination. Over to you for a minute. Thanks, Caitlin. Sorry, I, I don't quite understand the question regarding coordination. I didn't see it in the chat. Just Sorry, yeah, that's my fault for summarizing it. It was basically just noting that there are really kind of complex needs for better coordination between local missions and donors, funded projects and government initiatives, especially policy coherence among ministries such as energy, water, ag, and environment. So all things I know that you're kind of dealing with in CASI I thought you might be able to touch on that, how you're addressing a coordination need, but also I know you're really trying to focus on advancing more localization effort on climate action, as well as doing this policy coordination. Great, um, thank you. Thanks, Caitlin, yes. and I also, I found the question as well. Thank you. So, yes, I think that the answer to that question, those two questions actually come into one. So, in the case of, of Cassie, uh, as noted, we're taking a, a, a very locally led, localized approach. With that, we work with our local institutions who have strong connections within ministries and across stakeholders and their ability to coordinate um, needs in, in reflection to, of the policy uh, agendas. One key thing I also want to note is that there are efforts in place to ensure donor coordination through uh, through um, supported um, initiatives like the NDC Partnership. And as I mentioned, we work closely with the NDC Partnership, and their role is specifically to ensure that there isn't duplication of effort and that we're addressing uh, country priorities. So. That that framework has been very useful in in bringing together both the policy and the implementing partners and also additional stakeholders. Again, emphasizing that even through the NDC partnership, though that's a global effort, there are regional segments of that and then local um, local um, leads. And the same in in respects to Cassie, that we work with our local uh, partners and addressing the stakeholder needs, then also coordinating across bodies, like in the case of Africa, the African Union, to work across the co continent in regards to coordination. So I guess in summary, yes, it is complex, but we seem to be developing a system and a process through a network that's working across each of those levels of coordination and, and different um, projects and initiatives that are supporting the same efforts. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic, and appreciate the efforts you're doing to to deal with that coordination effort, which is no is no small feat. Um, so, and Ann Vaughn unfortunately had to drop. Um, so, I'm I think um, I'm going to close out the event now and just say thanks to everyone um, and our wonderful panelists for providing these critical insights that have really um, will inspire us to forge ahead in the year um, forward really integrating climate and ag action. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. We really appreciate your questions. We will try to um, be following up with those on AgriLinks. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. It'll be posted so you can share that. Check out the blogs like I mentioned. Um, and thanks so much to the AgriLinks team for making this happen. Um, and thanks again. Hope you all have a wonderful day and evening. And uh, um, yeah, thank you to the panelists.